No fucking way in hell am I putting my fingers in this demon dude's mouth. About here is where I got gang bashed for the first time. So he was legitimately just sitting there with his fucking chair leg straight through his face. And we'd be made aware that someone had a gun in there. It's a story about where we got shut down halfway through the night. It legitimately looked like this. And a, a very, very famous sort of crime family member's cousin. And he showed me a video of them pumping an old car with M16s. And he pepper sprayed the fuck out of him. The guy who ran this church and asked him if we could run a rave in the church. All the Sikh cab drivers would come here and eat at both those restaurants. And they used to fucking love to brawl. Looks fine now, Mr. Priest. Like, for example, I remember one of my DJs shitting on this train track for five bucks. I had zero responsibility and all I had to do was have fun. We didn't even have posters back then. So I would legitimately just book the lineup and text people on my phone what the lineup was and people would come down. Oh, let's rant. Now we're going to Burke Street, baby. Spent many, 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 many years on Burke Street and I personally think it's way more wild than King Street. I saw way more fucked up shit and I saw way more crazy shit on Burke Street. And I reckon it was because it was less busy. So there was more chance for crazies to roam free. So we're going to go to there tonight and check it out. I'm going to tell a couple of yarns, a couple of stories about my experience there. And some also some famous stories about the street in general when it comes to club culture and serious incidents that happen there. So let's go, baby. Clubland Chronicles episode two. Uh, behind me is Parliament. And I spent a long time of my life at a little club down here in the corner. So I'll start my adventure here and we're going to go all the way down towards Spencer Street. For many, many years when I first cut my teeth in promoting, I used to work on Burke Street. And it was the first club I ran myself solo. A place called Corova, which is just down here. We're going to walk over there quite in a second. Before I start, I probably should start here. But there's a story that I talk about on my TikTok where we talk about the 2am lockouts. This spot here is exactly where, where I put together that event that went viral. The, all the old guys cracked the shits about and I had to hand over. But this is where the protest was. So where we're standing right here, there was tens of thousands of people all the way down this street here. And everyone was sort of yelling and marching with sides and shit at the parliament. We blocked all the roads and whatnot. And effectively, we did that every Friday until they took the lockdowns down. That was a little win for the little people in the hospitality industry. And that was like 2010, I think. It was a while back. Um, it was sort of like an attack against violence on streets. So the media went nuts and they were saying like, the streets are war and all this other bullshit. So then they decided to do this 2 a.m. lockout to curb street violence, which it did absolutely nothing. And thank God for us, we were able to prove that. And alongside that and the protest, we got back what we needed, which was late night life in Melbourne again, which has always been a big part of Melbourne's ecosystem and culture. So just here was Corova Milk Bar, uh, which was an iconic, famous venue. Now it's called Angel Bar, that many DJs across Melbourne who blew up, guys like Joel Fletcher, uh, JDG, Mike Metro, Mickey Knox, Heath Renata, um, Stevie Mink, the list goes on. That's where they cut their teeth and they blew up. Um, I used to run that with a friend of mine, Kyle, and eventually I took over it myself. And I ran it for five years, and it was so fucking successful. We used to get so many people up here, there'd be people everywhere, walking all along here, all the way through here. We get so many of them that the police used to give us banning notices and fines for obstructing the pathway. I'll go into a whole bunch of stories there in a second, but I'll show you where we had to move after because we'd have literally three or 400 people up and down the street here. It looks a lot different now than it used to. Um, you couldn't see in, and then it was basically like a guard standing at the front door, um, and you would wait there, and he would, I would be standing on a pole just there where that tree was, effectively nodding him or doing that to him, which meant that you were going to come in or you weren't going to come in back in the peak days. And anyone who attended would remember his name was Noel. He was one of the nicest door guys in Melbourne, very loved by many. And the other owner was a guy called Moody, and there was also another guy called Brendan that owned the place. Moody still, I believe, owns the Angel Bar right now as we talk. So here, when we got busy, we, would, we used to have to access the back door there and the line would go all the way down that alleyway, all the way up here, all the way around the corner. So we'd have hundreds and hundreds of people in line at any given time. And the venue used to only hold like 200. So sometimes there was more people outside than there was inside the actual fucking venue. When we used to run that, the style that we used to run there was a style called Melbourne Bounce, which was sort of like the birthplace or one of the birthplaces of that style. So it was fucking mental. People would literally smash and stomp the walls. It was honestly one of the highest and biggest vibes I've ever seen. People just fucking would scream and yell. And I'm just sorry, over here they used to have police every weekend, but they weren't real police. They were what we used to call Muppets, which stood for most useless police person ever trained. Effectively, they're like met pigs, fucking V-line coppers or whatever they're called now. And they would stand up there. So anytime there was any sort of issue, they would be over here straight away. So I remember one time two of the boys were arguing just here. And one of them ran over and he had a crack because he was saying like, you know, I'm fucking arguing with my mate, like leave us alone. And he pepper sprayed the fuck out of him. And we had him over here 
And we literally had to go buy milk from 7-Eleven and we were just pouring it on his face trying to stop. Funnily enough, that exact same corner there uh, was where I became friends with one of the owners from Lucky. Um, basically, I had a biff with his, my friendship group had a biff with his friendship group right on this corner. So as soon as we walked down this corner away from the guards, we got it on. And then afterwards, we were arguing and fighting and whatnot. Uh, we ended up all coming to terms and sort of shook hands on it and we all became great friends and friendship still exists to this day. That's actually my partner in Hello Sunshine that I ran that event with is the guy that who he and his group of friends, me and my group of friends, punched on right there. A very suburban love story, no doubt. So there's a cool little story that I haven't told before, but basically it's a story about where we got shut down halfway through the night. So we were running Grover at one point and um, one of the owners, just in that chair with those people sitting behind me, um, on a couple of nights or weeks beforehand, he punched a punter who was being a smart ass. So he'd been kicked out and he's been a fuckwit and he, he decked him. And basically the guys who owned the club had said that they'd lost the footage so there was no footage to be able to show or prove that he'd done the wrong thing. So the coppers decided to teach us a lesson that night. It was on my night on the Friday. Um, they rolled in about midnight and they came into the room and they requested to get the hard drives, which you can. So all the hard drives for the cameras and they pulled them all out. But because the boys didn't have backup hard drives, which they were well aware of, uh, they took them out and it meant that we had to close the club and it was midnight. So I had a line all the way down to Metro, like probably two, 250 people in the club, all with somewhere wanting to go. So I actually called the owner of Wawa, a guy called Steve, and I was like, hey, can you please open up for us? I've got 200 people here who want to drink. We're going to come down because the cops just closed us down and they pulled the hard drives out of the, out of the camera so we can't operate. Um, we're literally going to walk down there now, chuck on the exact same line up in the DJs. If you're keen, open up and we're going to fucking, we're going to continue the night on. And he was up for it, so we literally, about 250 of us marched all the way down Burke Street and we went to Wawa. He opened up and all the DJs got to play their sets uh, in that club. And we, I don't think we finished up to like 6, 7 a.m. Some of the shit that went on here at this joint was fucking insane. Like there was a couple of times where we had issues with people with guns, where someone would we'd be made aware that someone had a gun in there, um, which was pretty scary. But um, luckily for us, nothing ever really kicked off. And we had a lot of people in the north and west there at one point when I was running it. So because of that, I came with drama. A lot of like ethnic groups and whatnot would clash. There was a lot of like there was a lot of tension from the area that would come here and follow on. Same as when we first started, it was a lot of stuff from the southeast would carry on from like Roval fucking. Glen Waverley, one turn area would come in, but over there was a lot more serious and some of the guards were tied up in it. I remember one of the guards that used to work there, one of his brothers actually got shot and killed in a panel shop over in the west or north at one point. So that was pretty sad. I won't go into it too much more because I don't want to incriminate anybody, but it was a pretty wild place and there was a lot of wild things that went on in that joint. It was one of my favorite places I ever worked at. I think it was because where I really started. And I, it was the first thing I ran myself without any boss. And to be honest, it was the fucking dream back then. I was like 21 to 25 and I did fuck all. I made enough money to live off that. I was making like three, four grand a week. I would literally just recover all week, hang out with my mates, drink beers, fucking play Tekken. And then on Friday, come back out and do the exact same thing and just get smashed a weekend. So it was the days, I'm not gonna lie, it was actual days. I had zero responsibility and all I had to do was have fun. We didn't even have posters back then. So I would legitimately just book the lineup and text people on my phone what the lineup was and people would come down. We built an institution with all the DJs that played there. So everyone knew what they were in for. They knew they were gonna get mad music. And they knew they were gonna get premieres of new tunes that no one had ever heard. So they'd just come down because you didn't want to miss out because if you did, you, you were gonna hear about it for the next week throughout all your friends. It's gone now, but over there, there used to be a restaurant. Um, and Mick Gatto would eat there regularly. So we used to sit on the door and I'd literally lean up against this tree, smoking bulk darts. And I, I would see Mick Gatto and his crew eating dinner over there um, all the time. And as I was saying before, one time I remember they were legally parked and the Muppets came down to tell him to move his car park. They went down there and they like basically had a chat with him. And they said, hey, look, you gotta move your car. And there was two like Mercedes S-classes or whatever they were at the time there. And legitimately all six of them got up, all three got into one car, three got into another car. And they moved not even a meter, like half a meter. And then they all got back out and, and continued to eat at the restaurant. I was saying in those early days, I reckon that Berkshire was a lot more rougher because there was less people around. So we used to have heaps more drama up here. Um, for example, there was this thing that used to happen here and this joint is now closed, but both of these were Indian restaurants back in the day. And uh, basically, they, this is where the Indian guys would eat. So all the Sikh cab drivers would come here and eat at both those restaurants. And they used to fucking love to brawl. So there used to be tables and chairs all along here. The majority of the time it was like cab drivers were, um, having their break or whatnot, and they would be eating here. But regularly, like I'm talking like once a month, there would be brawls. And you'd just watch cabs roll in from everywhere. There'd be cabs everywhere. And they would have full on brawls. And I remember they would take off their belts and all shoes and they would smash each other with them. So they used to have mad punch-ons, the old Sikhs. 
Um, and I used to see it all the time because it was like a congregation sort of hangout spot for them uh, back in the day. So when we weren't getting brawls at our club, we were watching the cab drivers brawl uh, here at the front of these restaurants. A weird memory to highlight, but right about here is where I got gang bashed for the first time. So I started it so I can't, I can't play victim. Uh, a friend of mine was over here and he was having a drama with someone uh, over something. I can't even remember what it was because I was blind. And uh, I got involved and it turned into a little bit of a scuffle. And basically I'd said to the guy, like, what are you going to do about it? Because I was about to go home. So I started to walk over to a car park over there. And as I did, I heard a kerfuffle out that door right there. And uh, about, ten, I can't even remember, I'm not going to say a figure, but a lot of dudes ran out and jumped. So at that point, I'm like, whatever. All I could do was defend myself. So I was standing smack bang in the middle of this fucking uh, railway. When a, when a whole bunch of them, it would have been 10 plus, it got me. I sort of tried to keep my ground for a little bit, but of course I got overwhelmed and running straight in the middle of this tram track. And they were kicking the absolute living shit out of me. And believe it or not, I didn't have a fucking bump on my head afterwards. I think because so many of them were kicking me at the one time that they were kicking each other in the feet that I actually came out unscathed. And my poor mate who was with me, the one who started the altercation that we got in trouble with, he got chased all the way up here and he got clobbered by about two of them. So I ended up coming out of bed, I was getting bashed by 10 or 12 of them than he did by two of them. And the lesson to that story is don't be a dickhead because if you play silly games, you get silly prizes. And I got a silly prize that night on that tram line joint here back in the day was a very iconic venue called Metro. So Metro was arguably one of the most famous nightclubs and most historical nightclubs in Melbourne. I was definitely one of the first. It was running for a fucking very long time throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s and so on. Uh, guys like Molly Meldrum used to hang out here. It hosted the likes of like Prince. It used to have a lot of band shows and massive artists. I remember seeing Wolf Mother here. I saw Prodigy here. But they used to also run club nights. Uh, the guys were on title. They actually cut their teeth here. This is where their first nightclub was. Um, I used to, this was actually my favourite venue in all of Melbourne. I absolutely loved coming here. It was like four stories high as you can see. And there was like this massive fucking amphitheatre area in the middle that kind of ducked down with a stage. And then there was a second level that was like a proper room. There was a third room which was like a VIP room. And then right at the top they called it the fishbowl. And that was like the v VIP room. So you could watch over this giant thing and there'd be three to four thousand people there. And there'd be people all along here. Like, it was fucking, when it was at its peak, it was easily probably the, not probably, it was the busiest club in Melbourne. When I went there, it was called All Beautiful, but it changed a whole bunch of times. Anywhere was like the last one before they knocked it down. So anyway, why is it not there anymore? It was Heritage listed. This thing had been there forever. It used to be a theatre before that. A lot of famous club owners ran it or owned it at one point. A lot of famous promoters ran it or owned it at one point. I reckon all the most famous promoters ran shows in it, and some of the biggest bands in the world played there. So basically, why it's still not there, sorry, I, I digressed for a little bit. Um, was that some investors, overseas investors bought it and they were well aware that they couldn't touch it. So everyone was like thinking that it would get handed back and we could continue to use it as a venue. But basically what happened was they worked out that the fine, they would make more money in the property by knocking it down and copping the fine than they would just leaving it there and letting it die. So they just fucking ripped the guts of it out and they completely ripped all the history out and they paid the fine. So unfortunately for everyone in the music industry, we saw the death of this place. So one of the most iconic joints in the world and now it's a shitty little hotel with fuck all history or any ties back to it. I think there's a little sign on the side, uh, which I saw before that kind of like shows a little bit of love back to it, but it's not even called the Metro anymore. So that was fucking the best venue I reckon that ever existed. Uh, another wild story about out here, obviously there'd be millions of them, but this is just one because it's a pretty fucked up one. Um, when it was, I don't even remember what night it was. Here we go. Oh, sorry, here's the sign. So there you go guys, that's, that's all that's left of it. So they ripped it down. As you can see, bands playing, staircase, it was like a big auditorium. Um, that's what it looked like at the front, that's how I remember it, but it said Metro on it, Natural Amphitheatre. It was fucking unbelievable. And that was called, at the end of it, it was called the Palais, but it wasn't, it was the Metro. They changed it to the Palais just before it sort of went knocked down. So anyway, the story goes, there was basically a giant line out here, and there had been a biff, I can't remember if it was in or out, and people got pushed out here. And up there, exactly what I was talking about, where all those all the cabbies used to punch on, uh, there, a fight erupted, and someone picked up a chair and piffed it and threw it, and the chair went straight through this dude's eye and went into the back of his head. And it was on the news and whatnot. I remember seeing the x-rays from somewhere, it kind of went viral, but the dude basically had a chair just like completely hanging out his face. He did live, but that was a story in my era that uh, everyone sort of saw and that they knew of, because it was fucking probably the one of the rankers that I'd heard of, or people had seen. A lot of people I knew saw it too. So he was legitimately just sitting there with the fucking chair leg straight through his face. This may or may not be of interest, but I saw Prodigy there, I reckon it was 45 degrees. And I remember going with all my mates and we were in there. Prodigy at the time was fucking so huge and so good. Rest in peace, Keith Flint. But anyway, we were all in there and we were like dancing, but it was so
and that was sort of a part of it. I remember there was this one guy who was pretending to be blind, and um, as a car came past, the cab came past, he threw the bottle through and just smashed the window for absolutely no reason. So the Muppets at the top of the uh, stairs, the uh, police officers that weren't really police officers, they would always be dealing with them too, because there was heaps of homeless people around here. And I think it was just because it was quieter. Walking down to the next spot of Bell Street Clubs, uh, I'll tell a story, but I don't want to name what club it was, but one time I was in one of the back rooms, and a, a very, very famous sort of crime family member's cousin or fucking nephew or something was there. And he showed me a video of them pumping an old car with M16s. So that was pretty wild, but I'm not going to name the club because I don't want to connect anyone to it. But uh, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. So here was like the, one of the peak tier fuses. So there's multiple tier fuses. And as we go through these tours, I'll kind of keep bringing them up and pointing them out. But one of the biggest ones probably had like a big stretch of like six years. I worked here more on the long weekends. I used to come on the Saturdays, but I never actually worked on the Saturdays. A lot of my boys from Corova, uh, we actually had like a breakup at one point, like a bust up, and a fair few of them came down here and stayed and worked a part of their crew because they were like, wouldn't really let them play at other places where my guys were more allowed to play wherever the fuck they wanted. But they were so loyal to the sound in that club because it was so iconic. And it's such an institution that they want to be involved to it, involved with it, so they decided to go there. They actually end up owning a bit of it. TV has a bit of a dark history. Uh, this venue definitely had a bit of a dark history too. Uh, it's a history that it's not my story to tell. Hopefully one day one of the boys comes on and lets me tell it or, let, or tells it to me because it's a really fucking interesting story. Um, it had multiple dark histories. So the majority of the venues sort of unfortunately uh, finished up on very, very obscure and uh, bad terms, I would say. The majority of people will remember this being TFU, but that's where it was. So it was this space here. It was two stories, um, and it used to walk up the stairs here, or somewhere near here, there'd be guards and whatnot, and they used to have a smoker's area on the footpath, and you would walk up into the two stories. So this here, this joint was insane. So this was the peak of sort of Melbourne sound, I would say. Um, and basically, this was the mecca for it. So if you were a diehard, uh, you would listen to guys like Orchestrator, Nick Coleman, um, Spacey Space, fucking Boogs, all the big dudes. They were all here, they were all residents. It was like the revolver of the city in a sense. It definitely was the beginning of Melbourne Bounce. No doubt, without TFU, it doesn't exist. That style that blew up around the world does not exist without this joint. It doesn't exist without Corova either, but this was definitely the heartbeat of it. Legitimately, that joint there, we used to go so fucking off because it was like a fashion and trend at the time where people would stomp the ground and slap the walls as hard as they could. So you'd have like an orchestrated setup there where they'd be playing Melbourne uh, Sound back then, it was called, and they'd be playing the Melt, which was like a sort of offbeat bass drum, 128 with acapellas or rap acapellas over the top of it, or all classic house acapellas. People would be stomping and slapping the walls so hard that if you were down below on the bottom level, sometimes you couldn't hear the music. Other times you would actually see dust falling from the ground. I remember we did an event there with a guy called Phil Kieran from overseas, he's from Ireland, and he played a song called I Think I'm a Monster, and it went so fucking off, I legitimately thought that the floor was going to break through and we are going to all go through and die. You could actually feel it fucking moving. I used to get so messy at this joint. <laughs> I know, I used to get a messy at a lot of joints, but by far I used to get the messy at this joint. The guy that used to run it was a guy called Jason Colback, and I remember one time I got kicked out for falling asleep under a basin, and basically he sin binned me in their back office because I didn't want me staying out the street because I was too pissed until I sobered up. And then after I did like an hour, an hour and a half of sitting on the chair where he wouldn't allow me to even put my feet on the ground, um, once I did my time and my penance, he let me back out to play till early hours of the morning. I know I've just said it's not my story to tell, but I will tell you that the place did get inundated with gangsters. There was a lot of gangsters in this venue. There was a lot of um, politics around this venue uh, that was related to serious crime. So like a lot of it, Towards the end, it got pretty kind of scary in there. So you're either a music fan or you're a heavy that was in there partying. The road was Welcome Stranger, which is still there, and that's open 10 a.m. to 7 a.m. So people would leave there, get chopped, and go there and play the pokies. And there was also a lot of other sort of like hobos or less desirables that would hang around there too. So it wasn't unusual that they'd be clashing on the street, both of these audiences. This place would be packed till 7 a.m. I feel like it was 11 p.m. at 7 a.m. It didn't really ever stop because Corova was the same. That was open the same amount of time. And then there was Wawa down the corner that was also open till like 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. So there was plenty of venues you could come here and you could stay out till 8, 9, 10 a.m. in the morning on a Sunday. So as you can imagine, because of those licensing rules and all those clubs being open that late, there would be creatures just rolling around everywhere. Walking out of here during the middle of daylight was pretty fucking grim, but not as grim as Chapel Street and Tram. We could kind of sneak off into the background of the city and and get away with it and not feel as bad, or walk down the front of the street and catch a tram. Story before, but basically there was a night, or when I used to run my events here, where the boys had asked me when I was running Corova to come down because they were trying to tidy the crowd up, because the crowd was starting to get pretty hectic, because they were having a lot of fights and a lot of dramas. So I was like, yeah, yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I'll happily be involved with it, because I knew who was who, who the good guys were, who the bad guys were, from the other nights I was running. 
So I sort of said, look, I'm not going to stand at the front because I'm not one of those guys that would be like, nah, fuck you, dog, because I didn't really, that wasn't my vibe. I was a promoter, right? I had to be the people's person. So I stood on one of the corners over there and I basically would just, again, like I said before, would just nod or, or just move my head to the guards and then they would say yes or no. And I remember there was a group of Middle Eastern dudes that had figured out that I was doing it and they fucking went nuts and they threatened to bash me. The guards sort of pushed them on and it was about 5 a.m. that night. So they were sort of hanging around because they were hoping that I was going to knock off. So no doubt they could bash me. Um, and they were hanging around and I sort of waited and waited and waited until they fucked off. They'd been gone for an hour or two and then I decided I was going to go pick up my car to drive home. But that was the first night I ever saw a GHP overdose and that was just down over here. So it was just up here but I'm walking around, right? I'm fucking paranoid. I was thinking I'm about to get jumped by Middle Easterns to knock them back on the door when I hear this strange fucking noise. And that noise was like... Bleh, bleh. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, I'm like, is that a fucking demon or some shit? So anyway, I get here to this exact point here and I can see this dude is laying in this arcade on the ground, like over here, and he's smashing his head on the ground. And I'm thinking, what the actual fuck is this guy doing? So I'm thinking he's like possessed by the devil or some shit because I've never seen a GHB overdose. For those that don't know what GHB is, it's like a chemical floor cleaner and people take in like a plunger and they take it by the mill, but like even like an inch over your dose you can die from it it's that dangerous and they have these really aggressive blowouts which are one of the most fucked up things i've ever seen but i actually saw so many of them i became accustomed to them which is super fucked up but this is my first one so this guy's over here and he's smacking his head against the uh, ground like this like bang 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 and i'm like i don't know what to do here kind of quickly realized he wasn't possessed right i put him into that position where I, like the vomit one when someone's too drunk or something goes wrong with them that i've learned in first aid at school or whatever so I put him in that position here and he kind of kept worming out of it. So I started to land on him and I called the and I called the ambulance. So I'm called triple zero and I'm like, hey, I've got this dude who's like basically being possessed by a demon. He's smashing his head against the ground. I don't know what the fuck to do. Like I have no idea. So I was on the back of his head and whatnot. And they basically had said to me, can you put your fingers in his mouth? And I was like, no fucking way in hell am I putting my fingers in this demon dude's mouth. So I said, no, I basically straight up said, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Like I'll sit here with this guy, but I'm not putting my fingers in his mouth because there's a good chance I'm going to lose him and I'm pretty keen on my fingers. So I sat with this dude until the Ambrose came and the Ambrose pulled up just there, I remember, and they came down here and then um, they were like, he would sort of stopped uh, kind of bumping his head on stuff and screaming, but he was still sort of squirming around. He didn't look in a good way. And I don't know what they did with him. I've said this in the YouTube video, but they sort of stabbed him with something. And then after they stabbed him with something or whatever it was, he sort of came kind of back to normality. He was all like kind of woozy all over the place, but his, his eyes back had life in him. He wasn't rolling him back like the fucking exorcist. So they took him away. And I, at that point, I had no idea what it was still. So I walked off and I walked home to live my life, not knowing what it was. But in a few short months, I became a professional in that exact same situation. I was seeing sometimes seven, eight at night uh, when GHB was at its worst in Melbourne. Uh, I got so accustomed and used to watching them that I could tell what level they were, like if we needed to call the ambulance or if they just needed to sit down for a bit, if they needed to cool down or if we needed to get rid of them. Some of the things they used to do was they'd start to masturbate or they would sort of almost get wobbly. Um, we would actually just tell their friends to fuck them off because we didn't want them to blow out in our venue because we'd get in a lot of trouble from police and ambulances. I'm not proud of that we did do that, but we'd be like, get rid of your friend, he's juicy, he's bound, he can't come back again. It's not our problem, take him around the fucking corner and do what you need to do. I would have saw hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them over my time in that three year period where it got really, really bad. The story just popped into my head as I was walking back up to my car at Corova. But the guy who ran it was a guy called Moody who was a guard at TFU, but not that TFU, another TFU, which we're gonna go to in another episode. But basically, I knew Moody because he fucking hated me. Because I used to go there and get so sloshed and I was annoying as fuck and I thought I ran the joint. And he didn't like that. So I remember one time I pinched his nipple as a joke and he, he full bitch slapped me in the alleyway in front of everybody. And I got sim bin on a milk bar, milk crate because he only didn't want me to leave until I sobered up. Another time I was really, really fucked and I didn't even properly remember it, but he threw me down the stairs. So when I went up there to go talk to him about running the club and running the night, my first ever night, it was a bit of an awkward conversation because the only memories that I ever had of him prior to that was him throwing me down the stairs and bitch slapping me. But we became very, very good friends, very, very close friends. And he was one of my favorite people I ever met in the club world. And again, I don't know why, but so many of my stories start with me getting punched or, or a fight or some sort of altercation um, when it comes to my friends in the club world or friends in general. Maybe that was just my error. It's probably strange to some, but like as I walk through these streets with all these alleyways and these lights and whatnot, um, I guess some people, I'm by myself. I'm completely walk around by myself. I always did, always have. Never felt unsafe in Melbourne. Obviously heaps of unsafe shit's happened when I've been here. Like for example, I remember one of my DJs shitting on this train track for five bucks. I get this nostalgic feeling 
and a comfort. So when I'm here, I actually feel comfortable and I feel relaxed. Like it's the opposite of what people sort of tell you that if you're in the city by yourself, you're gonna be scared, you're gonna be worried and whatnot. Uh, I feel the complete opposite. I feel super comfortable. I feel relaxed. I actually feel like I'm at home. But now we're at the tail end of Burke Street, uh, which is the corner of Burke and King. Well, we've been to King before. I've only done one part of it, which is the back part. I haven't done that part of it. But this is also um, an important sort of club precinct. But obviously the busier part of Burke Street was up towards Spring Street. This part here was also pretty busy. But even though this next club sort of emulates into King Street, it's still on Burke Street, so I'm gonna put in the Burke Street version. Um, I've got a long history with this next joint. It's a venue called RMH or Burke Street Courtyard. I actually named it Burke Street Courtyard, believe it or not. But I've been working in this venue for about 15 years and my business partner, Wet Pussy, his family owns this venue. So that's how I met him. I did events here back, back in the day. And they, my first ever event there was called Lockdown. And it was basically like a jail raid because Old Melbourne Hotel used to actually be the police holding cells. So the jail cells are still in the fucking venue. And because of that, I loved it. I just had this lure and this, I love the heritage, I love the history, I love the fact that there were still bars there, old prison doors, looked like an old Melbourne jail. So I just had to do an event there. And I did events there for years and years and years, every Queen's birthday called Lockdown. It's also where I ended my career. So the last club night I did was a Saturday night called Code at this venue. And it ran for two years and we used to do like 14 to 1600 people a week. And the line would literally wrap from there all the way down King Street. It was insane how many people we used to do. After COVID kept hitting us over and over and over again. That was a point where I figured out that I didn't love it anymore and I needed to give it up. So I actually sold my percentage to my partners and I moved on and that was the last club night I ever ran. That was 2022. So let's go check out RMH or Burke Street Courtyard. So anyway, we used to do a lot of events here. Um, this is the area where the people who would get kicked out for being too pissed or uh, too juicy would congregate. Um, we couldn't see them obviously because we'd be running the door there and basically I, every now and then we'd have to get ambulance to come in here because we'd discover one blown out in that area. People used to piss there too. But this is the venue, look, look how fucking sick it is. It's an old as fuck building, I don't know how old it is. It's been around for a very, very long time. It actually says. Well, there you go. 1889. So it's been around since 1889. So it's heritage listed, the whole building is. There's all these nooks and crannies. I'm going to do another series where I actually go into venues and I show you guys around them. So all the back areas, all the back stages, all the access points and whatnot. I'm not going to do that in this because this is not what this is about. This is just stories on streets. This venue's got so many crooks and crannies and little fucking pathways and little entry points and exit points. It's amazing because it's all, all old and little prison cells and all kinds of weird shit. So now this is the home of XA54, which is probably Melbourne's biggest techno night. Uh, before that was Co, which I ran obviously, and before that was Bang. So Bang there was there for 15 years, and no doubt if you've ever listened to emo music or punk music or rock music, you know it. So it was basically the staple of that genre for 15 years, and it was the home of it. And it still continues to be, they still do events there to this day, over long weekends and whatnot, and they still dominate, so Destroy Alliance, those guys now run good things, they run not fast, but those guys started here. So from humble beginnings, they started running nightclubs here. So you would have seen if you've watched all my podcasts, there's a story where myself and a guy called George G talk about how we shut down Burke Street and ran a rave, a full blown side trance rave on Burke Street on New Year's Day. Well, this is the location that we ran it in. So this street here, we shut down completely from here, all the way along this tram line, down until uh, just past the church there. So this whole area here was completely blocked off and fenced off. And we had our entry here, and we had access to the venue, which is RMH. And then we had uh, a stage on the main stage, which I will show a photo right now. Yep, that's how fucking sick it look. And then we had access to the church. So we're actually running on a secondary stage and bars and whatnot, and also to the St. John part in there. So it was sort of like a chill rest area was the church area, but we had access to it till midnight. We did about four and a half thousand people, 2,900 of you the cancel. Um, and we completely sold it out. We had all these Israeli Psytrance acts and it was fucking mental. We custom built a stage, we had a stage set up and we had like, these Bushdoof guys come in and they sort of built it, which you would have saw in that photo that I've just posted before. It was pretty iconic. I don't think anybody else has ever shut down Burst Street to run a rave. All right, so if you follow my content, you would have seen another video that I do where I talk about running a rave in the church. So we're gonna go check out that church that we ran the rave in. So while I'm walking there, I'll tell you the story. So we shut down this whole street, and as you know, we're on Burke Street, and years and years ago, a guy called, 
I can't remember his first name, Gulagas or Gulagas or something like that. He ran over some people on Burke Street about a week before Christmas. Because of that, uh, there was heightened security issues with this street, but streets in Melbourne in general. And the fact that we were doing a street party was sort of in bad taste. So the council came to us and said, you know, you've got to put in water barriers and a lot more other stuff to prevent someone driving into your event because you're going to have all these people along this street here. So we were like, how much is that going to cost? And we cost it now, it's going to cost about 30K. When we do these events, it's already going to cost us like 130,000. So it's going to be 160K, which meant there wasn't going to be a lot of profit in the event. But second to that, we also thought it was pretty bad taste to run an event on Burke Street when what happened has just happened. So we hatched a plan. And that plan was to talk to the, the guy who ran this church and ask him if we could run a rave in the church. To our surprise, he said yes. We had some stipulations and we had to be out by 10 p.m. But he said we could run a stage through that church uh, for our rave. So we had a techno guy, a super famous guy called Oxia. And Oxia has a song called Domino, which you can check out. But I'm going to, you should be listening to that song. I'm actually going to play it as I explain the setup for the church this day. So we used the whole inside of the venue, which is like four rooms. They've got two levels, so upstairs and downstairs. And then we had all this area here completely fenced off. And then we had the exit entry there for the gate. So you bought a ticket, you entered from that side, but you could walk through any of these four rooms and you could also walk into this church area. That's the old church here. At the back there, we had the sort of bar set up and we also had um, St. John's and whatnot, because at the end of the day, it was a rave, so we needed that. And we had the stage set up uh, over in this area here. So this whole area here was completely consumed with people uh, watching Oxia on a big stage set up, dancing. So the background was legitimately that. So you can imagine, it was like sort of 8 p.m. so the sun was going down, Oxy was playing in his garden, in this church fucking courtyard. Um, you can hear the song in the background right now. I've got it playing in the background. And we're watching the sunset come over this fucking church, listening to this awesome techno song. Um, just think to myself, how the fuck did we get in a situation without a run a rave in the church? But it was one of the most iconic events I did. Uh, I've done heaps of cool ones, but there was definitely up there in the sort of top five, top 10 ones that I did, was the rave that we did in the church. We paid the priest, we gave back the venue basically unscathed. The grass was actually pretty fucked to be honest, but he wasn't happy about that. It had cost, and it took about a year to grow back. And I remember I'd come here all the time and check it out. And it took ages and ages to grow back. But as you can see, it looks fine now, Mr. Priest. There's another story that I tell. There's another story I tell when we did this street party was we were using this church area for St. John's. And that day was when we did the Psytrance one. So anyone who knows anything about Psytrance would know that there's an appetite for narcotics for Psytrance. So that day we actually had a lot of dramas and issues with narcotics. It was a very, very hot day and they were having adverse reactions to them. It was a multiple different factors. So we had St. John's set up in the church. So these people that were having these adverse reactions at all slash ODs were getting taken into the church to be dealt with by St. John's, which was rather sacrilegious in my opinion. I feel like if I was going to wake up from an OD, the last place I would want to wake up was, was a fucking church. So I'm not sure those dudes are going to heaven. One of those guys though was probably one of the weirdest ODs I've seen. He was getting pulled out on a wheelchair and because I don't know what was going on, he was completely strapped in like Hannibal Lecter and they were wheeling him up this exact street, straight through the middle, because I was trying to take him out to the ambulances which were parked on the tram line. And he was legitimately, he legitimately looked like this. That event, I made a joke to my, sorry, I made a joke to the owner here, which he didn't really love, but I'll tell you because I think it was pretty funny. So we obviously didn't have to pay for lighting because there was no need for lighting. Um, because it was a day party, it was a day event. That day we had about three or four ambulances lined up here and he was stressing out because he'd actually gone through a situation where someone had passed away at a festival that he was running not two or three months beforehand, which is a super unfortunate situation that he covers in the podcast. My first ever vlog that I did on this channel. I turned to him and I said, at least we didn't have to pay for lighting. I went down like a fucking concrete cloud. But over there is a place called the Alto. We used to have a lot of dramas with those guys, believe it or not. And he used to always pin us for sound complaints. So he was the biggest fucking pain in our side when we were doing these street raves. And he was probably the one that could have actually finished it. But they sold out during COVID and they actually used to call that joint the Hobo Hotel. So I don't know if it's fancy anymore, but basically what they did was, are they allowed to have all the homeless people in there? So when I was running Curry here for two years, basically that was full of dramas and full of homeless people. And there was a time we had to call the police on a guy who had a knife and whatnot but they uh, were getting paid a lot of money to house homeless people across the road. And they were all right most of the time, but as you can imagine, you'd see some weird and pretty strange shit in the early hours of the morning when they were over there. 
So that's the end of my Burke Street tour. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please like, follow, subscribe, share it with a friend. Um, I'm going to keep doing these tours. My next one is Russell Street and all the little streets that run off that. Um, so wait for that because it's going to drop soon. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. I'm going to keep doing it regardless if you watch it or you don't watch it. But if you give me support, I'll give you some love.